Good afternoon. Welcome to BKL's latest property webinar, this time with a focus on some real world challenges that our clients are facing in the property sector. I'm sure most of you know us already and some of you may have been on last week's webinar, but in case um, in case you weren't, just a little introduction to us. Uh, we're a 26 partner accountancy practice with a head office in Finchley, North London. We have significant ambition to grow um, following taking investment in April this year. Property is our biggest single uh, specialism, making up nearly 25% of our overall business. Um, we have some very experienced property partners, all ably supported by our exceptional tax team. We are fortunate that we've got some very commercial, forward thinking and challenging clients. Due to this, we've been involved in some very exciting property projects and deals. We've seen some clients grow from buying their first investment property to selling a multi-site student accommodation portfolio and been with them the whole way. Since we have some very close relationships with our clients, we hear lots about the issues that they're facing, even outside of debits, credits and taxation. So, uncertainty, create, uncertainty certainly creates a difficult market and we are certainly in uncertain times. Increasing costs, increasing interest rates and a tight labour market means that the business of property is hoping that 2024 will be better than 2023. We speak to some lawyers who say they are super busy with potential deals in progress. And then we talk to some finance brokers who say that it's very hard to get deals across the line. However, the UK market is a sophisticated one with different lenders able to look at alternative ways of funding and structuring deals and a transparent and reliable financial and legal system making the UK with all its issues a safe place for those outside to look and in, to invest. So how can we help? As you know, the key to any building project is planning and we like to be involved as early as possible. Structuring for investment or for sale, efficient extractions, flexible structuring, joint venture agreements, VAT planning, tensions between S SDLT and MDR, capital allowances, Corporate interest restrictions are just a few things that we have lots of experience in helping clients with. This is quite apart from us being able to help with all your financial back office requirements. Today we have some ex some exceptional speakers. ESG is a rapidly rise is rapidly rising on the list of issues that the property industry is facing. We touched on this in our last webinar, and if anyone missed missed it, we can send you the recording for some bedtime listening. Uh, in an industry that needs urgent action, in an environment where this can be a challenge to implement, some people are driving change. And Marion Bailey is a partner and retrofit specialist at Studio PDP, a long-standing client of BKL. And as I mentioned earlier, I was involved in the audit as a junior about 20 years ago. An award-winning architect and author who specialises in low energy design and retrofit with sector experience in housing from prime to affordable workplace issues designed and delivered many large-scale complex, complex projects. Marion's retrofit works includes Princedale Road, which was the first certified uh, passive, passive house retrofit in the UK, and Garrison Chapel, 80 Strand, formerly the Shell Max House and Claridge House. She is also the architect for the new townhouses in Chelsea Barracks. Her book, Residential Retrofits 20 Case Study, is described as an invaluable text for those working in residential retrofit. Marion is frequently asked, invited to speak about retrofit and industry events and is an LA, NLA Net Zero expert panel member, board director of the Passive House Trust and an Architecture Award judge. As well as ESG issues, health and safety issues have come to the fore since horrendous tragedy at the Grenfell Tower. On the 28th of April 2022, the Building Safety Act was granted royal assent. This makes groundbreaking reforms to give residents and homeowners, homeowners more rights, powers and protections, so homes across the country are safer. Providing new leaseholders protection and providing residents in high rise dwellings more say in how their buildings are kept safe, as well as clarifying where the duty of care lies in property destruction, construction rather than destruction. The act is far reaching. BKL have worked with JMW solicitors for a number of years and they have been involved in many of our own business transactions. Today we have Jessica Stanway from the property management team and Priya Sedgepole from the property litigation team, and they'll be making introductions to the matters we need to consider. To regard, with regard to the Building Safety Act. Jessica joined DMW as a solicitor in the commercial litigation department in April 21 prior to joining DMW. Worked as a specialist in property litigate, working 
Jessica worked at a specialist property litigation firm. Jessica has particular ex expertise as to the legal implications of the property management and developments of all sizes, delivering thorough and practical advice and taking a sensible commercial approach to any litigation. Priya is a partner with over 10 years experience practicing property litigation and commercial disputes in the UK. Priya acts for multinational public companies, small and medium sized enterprises and high worth net, net, net individuals, including prominent landlords and celebrities. Priya's area of expertise ranges from residential and commercial possession proceedings, obtaining and resisting orders for sale, commercial forfeiture, um, relief applications, service charge disputes, council tax boundaries, boundary disputes, planning disputes, trespass, rights to light, and I assume plenty of other things, Priya. <laughs> In an economy of every ever increasing costs, business rates have con are a continued thorn in the side of the property investor and ensuring that the right rates are being paid is not an easy path to navigate. Empty rates can be a significant dry cost and the risk of being exposed to them is increasing as the economy stutters along to 2024. No rates review or empty rate strategy is ever the same and Ben and Ed have 35 years of experience in the market and this is invaluable in finding the best solution for clients. Ed is one of the co-founders of Fourview and has specialist and has specialist in providing business rates advice since 20, 2004. In 2006, he qualified as a member of the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors. 2008, following the increased business rates charges on vacant commercial property, his focus shifted to providing empty rates advice to landlords, developers and investors. Ben is an exceptional business rates advisor with over 18 years experience in providing quality trusted advice to business owners and occupiers. His experiences across all industries, including industrial, office, retail and leisure. Ben has an impressive track record of generating savings on business rates through his in-depth in market knowledge and meticulous approach. Um, if you have any questions during the webinar, please put them in the chat. And if we have time at the end, um, we will certainly point those to the, in the right direction. Um, and if we don't have time in the end, then um, we will make sure that they are passed on to those relevant so that we can follow up later on. Let me hand you over to Marion from Studio PDP for our first segment on retrofit. I'll just move along. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Jason. Really appreciated. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, today uh, for about 15 minutes about the world of retrofit, which hopefully speaks to you all as um, I'm sure you have a, uh, you live in a property that perhaps needs to be um, retrofitted also like most of the UK stock. So it it's, uh, it'll speak to you in terms of business, but also perhaps in occupant. Um, so a little bit of context first, because uh, it's important to understand why uh, the word retrofit is now uh, very um, common in the property sector. Uh, first of all, obviously, we're living in a world, and you've seen with COP28 being at the forefront of all the news at the moment, uh, that uh, our climate is warming up um, significantly and is uh, due to an increase in CO2 emission, which we need to curb to avoid the effect of um, uh, a a very, very damaging uh, rise of temperature above 1.5 degrees, which is Paris Agreement. So we've got to stop that graph growing any further um, uh, than uh, 1.5 degrees, which you might have heard at the moment. We're not on track globally around the world to achieve this. Um, so uh, it's it's really important to focus our attention to 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 this graph. Uh, another graph which is more relevant to our industry is um, the power that we have as property uh, sector um, player in reducing these carbon emissions that create that rise in temperature. So um, we uh, we need to reach net zero carbon by 2050. The net of net zero means that we need to have an equivalence between our emissions of CO2 and the carbon sinks, uh, which are here on the graphs. And the carbon sinks or CO2 removal can be done via um, forestry. Uh, also, all the plants, all the oceans capture CO2 very significantly. And there's also, you might have heard, some technical 
uh, advances made of uh, capturing CO2. However, there we can't really rely on this these uh, to to have a significant impact by 2050. So we've got to reforest our countryside um, on limit uh, together with limiting our, our CO2, reducing semi significantly our CO2 emissions. So uh, the sectors that concerns us um, are residential and tertiary, but mostly residential and offices, um, occupation and operation of buildings is um, responsible for a significant portion of the CO2 emission in our country. Um, the production of materials, so each time you, we specify, for example, a steel beam that has a very high embodied carbon uh, that emits uh, a lot of CO2s and we need to maybe reuse what we have before uh, specifying some new materials. Um, and then that's power. So it's making sure we use renewable energy to power our building rather than fossil fuel. So all our attention on these three topics within our industry will contribute towards the reduction of CO2 emissions. So as even though the the challenge at stake is completely overwhelming. We do have a, a chance to make a difference. Um, on an individual and professional basis, this is a, an extract from uh, the BBC as the key uh, six bullet points of what we can all do to play our role in reducing CO2 emissions. So it's you'll see that um, take fewer flights is number one. Uh, use less use less energy, so it's basically within the op operation of our buildings mostly. Um, uh, improve home insulation and energy efficiency comes number three, and this is why retrofitting is so important. It has a massive impact on the uh, country's CO2 emission. Then four, switch to electric vehicle and la or leave car free and then replace gas central heating with electric system like heat pumps and then eat less red meat as a last point. So if as an individual you want to play a role um, and as a professional <laughs> you also want to do something, then um, we definitely have um, you know a chance to to be impactful in our daily work and activities. So the reason why building this uh, retrofit is so important is that for centuries we used to occupy and keep our buildings relatively comfortable in a carbon neutral way um, because we, for example, used to burn timber, which is regenerative. Um, so that didn't create uh, this CO2 emission that we have now. But now that we have kitted our houses with lots of equipment and relying on fossil fuel, we're emitting these um, CO2 emissions, uh, which are the, the problem. So we need to move to a more passive uh, way of occupying and keeping our buildings comfortable, which means super insulating them and, and making sure we benefit from the solar gains as much as possible, while also re using renewable electricity to operate our buildings. Um, the definition of comfort is important because it has changed through the century. Well, before, you know, about 100 years ago, we used to be relatively content with, you know, maybe 17, 18 degrees internally. And nowadays we don't feel this is comfortable. You know, people expect about 21 degrees inside and a relative humidity between 40 and 60 percent with a CO2 concentration of below 1000 part per million. So that definition of comfort is really important for um, in the justification of retrofits, you know, if we were content with 17 degrees inside, we wouldn't need to do this massive challenge, but we are not. Uh, so we want to keep our comfort as it is with fossil fuel, but we need to um, uh, to to change this. Um, so what? what we need to do is as follows. So at the moment, 60% of our CO2 emission related to our homes relate to space heating, to heating, to the use of gas, gas uh, fossil fuel mostly. Uh, so this is the why insulation is the most important thing. You know, changing your uh, light bulbs to LED is good, but it's not going to cut it. Uh, space heating is the biggest, most impactful uh, way to reduce your emissions. Um, and so what you, we need to do as a country is switch to electric heating and reduce the demand of energy 
uh, from um, this big red portion here uh, to this uh, little green portion uh, on this on this pie chart here. So, um, in, so we can do that by using electricity from renewables. Uh, air sous-seat pump has a coefficient of three or four, which means that for each kilowatt hour that you take from the grid, it'll give you three or four for free. This is why air sous-seat pump is so interesting, is because it's it's got this enormous coefficient um, of efficiency. Um, so, so yeah, so it, you need to kind of, you need less energy to provide you with uh, internal comfort and obviously insulating your fabric so that you don't need um, uh, too much energy from your air to seat pump, so it's more efficient. Um, the great shift, this in blue here is the UK average housing stock. And in red is the uh, where we need to go. So we need to insulate and make our um, housing less hungry in energy. So instead of 130 kilowatt hour per meter square per year, we need to shift down to about 50. Uh, in other words, this is the, the sort of graph of um, gas fueled um, energy that our average housing stock consumes. We need to end gas now and uh, move to electricity while also reducing our demand. Uh, the Letty guidance, sorry, I fin didn't finish my sentence at the top here, it seems, um, for um, residential housing stock is uh, published on the Letty website. I would really definitely urge you to have a look. If as a client, you don't know exactly what to ask your design team to achieve, this is a really great tool as a briefing document as it addresses all the energy demand and gives a benchmark as what as an industry and all expert, we feel is reasonably feasible for the whole stock. On the right hand side is a Letty exemplar. So if you really want to push uh, your project further, then you can go down to um, further efficiencies. Um, the concept of retrofit is split around six criteria. So it's insulation, but obviously it's also about windows, ventilation, air tightness, thermal bridges, and moisture for retrofit is really important as well because um, you're dealing with existing building. So this is the same uh, criteria as the passive house standard, and that standard has been tried and tested and implemented on thousands of buildings over the last 30 years. So let's not reinvent the wheel and use this fantastic method. Even if we don't go down to passive house absolute efficiency, it's a great method to follow. Uh, we just need to remember to add the moisture aspect for retrofits. So if you can insulate from outside, this is much easier um, than insulating from inside. So uh, that's the, definitely the first uh, ex assessment to do with your uh, building. This is a building at the bottom of Regent's Park that we did a few years ago while in occupation. Uh, there's various methods of insulating outside with either um, you know, natural materials like insulating plaster or uh, rock wool, or you could do it with foam boards as well, and you can clad it or render it. There's many, many uh, methods of insulating outside. Um, you can also insulate internally, and this is this um, first passive house certified retrofit in a conservation area in Holland Park that I did about 13 years ago. Um, and it's is really efficient. It's also, though, space uh, hungry to do it inside to that level of passive house. Um, however, uh, this house has been functioning for 13 years with no radiators and just um, a ventilation system, super insulation and a very small air source heat pump. And we've uh, done some building performance evaluation um, uh, recently on that house to see if it still performs as it was designed 13 years ago and it's really really absolutely fantastically performing still uh, to the day. Um, again many different ways to insulate internally from using natural material vapor open material which means you can put the insulation straight on the brickwork and the moisture will go from outside to inside or you can use a vapor closed material like a foam board but you need to do that extremely carefully and I wouldn't recommend that method. 
uh, as you need a, a sort of vented cavity between the existing wall and the insulation layer. You can also change the windows for secondary um, to have a secondary internal window or change the original windows to double glaze or triple glazing. Windows uh, ha technology has evolved a lot and you have on the market now windows that achieve a sort of the same new value of a wall uh, in a retrofit context. Um, and so for a seven millimeter thick uh, piece of glass with a vacuum uh, process applied to it, you can achieve the equivalence of a triple glazing efficiency. So it's very uh, interesting to use these, especially in heritage context. And um, that is it for me. I hope that this has been um, of interest and that you understand a little bit better what the retrofit strategy entails. Thank you, Marion. Okay. We're just handing over now to uh, Ben and Ed from Fourview. Um, Thanks, Jason. Microphone. Um, OK, thank you. Uh, thank you, Marion, for that. Um, so look, what, what Ben and I want to cover is uh, um, a, a bit of a review on, on business rates. It's going to be sort of fairly high level. It's, it's obviously a pretty, pretty unpopular tax tax generally. Um, but what we want to just cover off is introduction to business rates, what business rates are and how they're calculated. Uh, a little bit from um, from the occupier's perspective in terms of the kind of key things you want to think about when when looking to reduce your business rates liability. Same then from the kind of landlord's perspective on on vacant property. When a property falls vacant, the liability reverts back to the landlord. And we want to kind of give give some key action points on what landlords should be thinking. And then we want to just close off with some of the topical issues. There's quite a lot topically going on with with business rates at the moment. Um, some some fairly big changes planned. So we just want to close off with sort of co covering those off. So 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 what are business rates? I'm, I'm appreciative of the fact that sort of people will have a general understanding of most of this. But but I think it's just useful to kind of have a recap on on, on what business rates are and how they're calculated. So business rates are, are a property tax charged on commercial property, and it's the occupier, as I said earlier, who pays business rates. Um, when that lease expires, that, that liability then reverts back to the landlord. Each, each property is given a rateable value, so it's given a, an independent rateable value assessment. That's all commercial properties, so all non-domestic properties, all non-residential properties. There's currently, I think, something like 2.14 million separate rating assessment so it's every shop every office every kiosk petrol station you name it if it's commercial it should it should have a rating assessment all of which is in the public domain you could you can look up what the rateable value is the rateable value in terms of in terms of what, what it what it represents it's basically a rental assessment of the property so it's, it's based on what the property in theory would rent for vacant and to let so if you're using an office building for storage, your rateable value doesn't doesn't necessarily come come down. It's based on what the property would be um, would, would be worth if it were vacant. The value is determined by the valuation office agency. So it's a central run group. They decide what the value should be when an appeal is submitted against the value. It's the valuation office agency who decide whether the rateable value should should be reduced should be reduced. Um, we go through frequent revaluation. So all of these rental assessments are regularly revalued. We've just gone into the 2023 rating list assessment. That's based on a valuation date always two years before the list comes into effect. The previous rating list was the 2017 rating list. So that, again, was based on values two years before the list come in, came into effect. Um, so if you think about that, just pause there for a moment. Think about the difference in value between the 1st of April 2015, the last revaluation, and, and the current valuation date we're looking at, 1st of April 2021. That you know, I, I don't think the valuation could, office could have a harder job in term, determining what these rental values should be for these properties. Given that we've had Brexit, we've had a complete shift in online to kind of online retail, and of course we've you know we've had a pandemic in the meantime, all of which has had an impact on commercial property value. So the 2023 rating list has been a really difficult one for the valuation office to get right, and I think there's going to be a lot of um, appeals that are submitted against the, the, the levels of values. The next revaluation, so going forward, they plan to have three yearly revaluations now. So next revaluation is due on the 1st of April 2026. That will be based on values at April 24. So again, two years before the list comes into effect. So anything you, if you're moving commercial property at the moment, the rent that you're going to be paying is probably a pretty 
yeah, if, if, if that's in the next six months, the rent that you're going to be paying is probably a pretty good indicator of where the values are going to be come the 2026 revaluation. It's the valuation officer's duty to maintain the rating list. And the reason I say that is because, because if you make a change to your property and it adds value to it, then in theory, the rateable value should be increased to, 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 to reflect that. Um, but it is down to the valuation office to, 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 to make that alteration. So yeah, if you build an extension on your commercial unit, for example, the valuation office don't pick up on it, then you have no obligation at the present time to notify them of changes that you've made that would impact that impact that value. Um, as I said earlier, Occupy is liable ultimately unless the land and, and, unless they their lease comes to an end and then it reverts to the to, to the owner essentially. If you've got a subtenant, then the, the liability reverts back to the to, to, to the head tenant and they and they pay the business rates. The liability isn't is uh, sorry, the rateable value isn't what you pay in liability. The liability is calculated based on the rateable value and it's multiplied by the uniform business rate or the U UBR or the multiplier as it's sometimes known as. I put together there a table of all the different levels of of of, of, of multipliers effectively. If you they, they they've now set it out so you have a small multiplier and a large multiplier. The large multiplier applies to properties with a rateable value of £51,000 and above. Smaller multiplier applies to everything below £51,000 rateable value. If you're in Greater London and you have a rateable value of, of, of above £75,000, you also pay a cross rail supplement. And if you're in the City of London, you also pay an additional supplement on top. The last, normally the UBR increases in line with inflation year on year on year. But actually, for the last three years, they've they've frozen the multipliers across everything essentially, so they've kept it at the same level. But in the autumn statement, just gone, they've announced they are going to increase the multiplier for large the the larger multiplier. So I mean, to put it put it into context there, if you've got a property in the city of London and it's let's say for the ease of maths, hundred thousand pound rateable value from the first of April next year your liability will be £58,000. That's what you pay to the, to, 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 to the City of London Council. So it's nearly, it's nearly in effect a 60% tax rate. I mean, it's, it's you know, business rates in the UK are some of the highest commercial property taxes anywhere, anywhere kind of in the world. Um, one thing I didn't add on my slide there was that, that at the moment, if you're a retailer, so retailer, hospitality and leisure occupiers, occupiers so if, if, if the property falls vacant, you don't get this relief, but at the moment you get 75% reduction, so you only pay 25% of the liability that you would otherwise have to pay, providing the property is open to the public and it's being used for, 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 for retail purposes. Again, autumn statement, they've just announced they're going to extend that into the new financial year, so for 2024-2025, that 75% reduction is going to be continue to apply to, 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 to retail occupiers, but there is a cap of £110,000 in benefit that you, you, you can see. So for the larger chain retailers, they, 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 there really is no benefit because they'll use up £110,000 very, very quickly. But if you're a smaller retail occupier, um, you know, you've got two, three or four retail units or, or just one, then, then effectively you, you only pay 25% of the liability that you would you would otherwise pay. So that's that's a bit of a kind of overall um, uh, yeah uh, an overall summary of what business rates are. And I say I'm sure most of you are sort of fairly familiar with that. Um, I'm going to pass over to Ben just to just to talk us through um, 2023 revaluation and the um, uh, and just just the kind of key triggers for for occupiers. Thanks, Ed. Yeah, if we um, if we can have a look at the next slide, it shows the Ed, Ed mentioned there was 2.14 million commercial properties that were assigned new rateable values, um, and that was from the 1st of April, uh, 2023. Um, and so that the the overall rateable value actually saw a, a seven percent increase in total value across England and Wales. Um, retail sector was the biggest winner, uh, with a 10 percent reduction in rateable value. Uh, offices actually saw a 10 percent increase in value on average. Um, across the two rating lists um, and industrial properties uh, saw the biggest increase with a 27%. Uh, other sectors that includes the likes of hospitality, leisure, education, transport and health, uh, they all saw a 4% increase across across the list. So, you know, you know some surprising uh, uh, differences there when, when you think about what Ed was talking about, the, the valuation date of the 1st of April 2021. You could, you know, that time, the, you had the combined effects of Brexit, 
it had the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. We were just coming out of a, a second lockdown. You know, there was a collapse really in the demand for new leases. Um, so, so there really was little transactional data. Um, and so, you know, whilst their average uh, changes, some parts of the country, certainly in the southeast, have seen in excess of 100% increases on the industrial property sector and, and in excess of 50 to 100% on some of the office uh, uh, parts of the, the country as well. So, yeah, there's definitely um, inaccuracies um, and certainly there's you know, these leading to, you know, these inaccuracies have led to some high levels of increases um, and possibly not enough in terms of expected reduction on, on some of that retail part. Um, so just to sort of move on to what we uh, what, what really are the triggers for occupiers to look at, you know, first of all, you know, everyone knows there's a possibility of being able to review your rateable value. You know, fortunately, the VO offer a, a three stage process, which is called check, challenge and appeal. And that option allows ratepayers to review their rates um, and contest them if they believe them to be too high. Um, so, you know, if there's been significant changes in, in valuation, then you know, we would always recommend a kind of forensic view. Uh, and review of of that assessment and there's, there's opportunity to uh, to reduce it yet yeah, outside of the level of value there are other opportunities of looking to reduce your liability certainly if you're entering or exiting a property so you know whenever a property move is going on um, if you think about it it doesn't happen overnight if, if a property um, if you're moving into an industrial property if you're moving to an office property then there's going to be fit out that needs to be carried out you may have exposure to two rates bills moving from one property to another. So, you know, there's opportunity there to work with the local authority and the valuation of the to negotiate possible reliefs or, or managing, it, managing yourself from one property to another. Other, other opportunities are fit out, refurbishment works. You know, these are, these are opportunities to try and look at um, securing possible reliefs or if, if anything, uh, looking at to try and delete the assessment entirely. Um, external works. So if you're if it's if it's affecting the enjoyment of the property. So if you think about uh, perhaps if there's road works going on or or works outside of a retail unit that's affecting footfall, or possibly in London there's a lot of you know, building works that happen where you've got you know large disturbances due to noise that's possibly you know, affecting the enjoyment of the office. There's there's allowances that can be negotiated on behalf of of, of occupiers uh, for that. And then also Right now, there's possibilities, you know, through loss of contract, maybe, or uh, is underutilization of space. So again, you know, we may be able to apportion rateable values between what the 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 occupier is using and and the vacant space to try and uh, generate further reductions on their behalf. So they're just some of the triggers really to look out for 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 where you may need to get a rating advisor to look at look at possible uh, reductions in your overall liability. And I think Ed's going to now speak around some of the landlord. Uh, site as well. Okay, thanks. And um, so, so yeah, once, once property, as I said earlier, once property falls vacant, the the liability comes back to the to the landlord essentially. Um, there is a, there is a grace period where no rates payable, after which 100% rates rates payable. Um, it's three months for a, for an office, a shop, or basically it's three months for basically everything apart from industrial property, which gets a six month void period before that full liability kicks in. It's just worth mentioning that that void period runs with the building. So if a tenant vacates before the end of their lease they may use up all some or all of that void period so by the time the landlord gets you come you may have to pay 100 percent business rates from 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 day one similarly if a company goes into administration so you've got tenant in administration you can almost guarantee if that winding up process of that business takes longer than than three months by the time the liability comes back to you as a landlord that you will be paying 100 percent rates liability from from day one there are some ongoing exemptions that apply beyond the statutory three or six months so for example listed buildings get get complete exemption similarly if you've got an empty so i said say listed building empty listed buildings get a complete exemption you don't you don't pay 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 rates on um empty buildings um empty listed buildings also, if the rateable value is below £2,900, it's also exempt from, 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 from empty rates. Um, retail relief that I mentioned earlier, 75% reduction, doesn't apply when the property falls vacant. So if you've got an occupier who's occupying as a tenant your, your space, they're getting they're only paying 25% in liability. They move out of that shop because their lease comes to an end. As a landlord, you don't get that same benefit. You pay 100% 100 rates liability. And also 
So the smaller and the larger multipliers that I mentioned, it automatically, when a property is vacant, uh, defaults to the larger, larger rates liability. So what I just want to kind of talk very quickly about is just kind of some of the action points that landlords should probably be thinking about when they're dealing with vacant property. The first one is around newly complete commercial property. So yeah, there's a really strict procedure to the local authority and it falls back to the local authority to serve essentially what's known as a completion notice to bring a property into a rating list. The great thing about them is they can't do it retrospectively. So you often end up in a situation you've, you've, you've reached practical completion on your site. It's three, four, five, six months before the local authority pick up on it. And then they have to go through this completion notice procedure to bring it into the rating list. They cannot do that retrospectively. Once a tenant is in occupation, so once you've let the space to a tenant, they can they can work back retrospectively. But while it's vacant, providing it is finished to a, a cat A standard, so in other words, it's it's it still requires a tenant's fit out before they could physically occupy it, they have to go through this completion notice procedure. And it's a really strict procedure. There's lots of there's lots of angles to kind of defer the onset of a new life ability when you're building out a commercial property. Similarly, if you're undertaking any refurbishment works to your property, you should always consider advice around whether or not the property should be deleted from the rating list. Do the works go far enough to have it deleted? And if they don't go far enough, and they have to be more than kind of just general cosmetic works, but if they don't go far enough, then we often give advice to, 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 to landlords, developers to say, well, actually, if you just add this, this and this, or if you if you change the sequencing of the way you're going to do these works, then, then that will get it deleted from the rating list. And when it's deleted, you pay no business rates. And again, it kind of goes back to that point at the beginning about the completion notices. Once it's out of the rating list, they have to go through the completion notice procedure before they can bring it back into the rating list. So actually getting something deleted. And I, I have these conversations quite quite regularly with, with clients where they're saying, well, look, actually, I've got a three month void period and my program of works here that I'm going to refurbish this space is only a couple of months anyway. So I'm not I'm not paying rates during the period of works, but actually getting it taken out of the rating list. It will ha often have a benefit way beyond the point at which those works complete. Often it will stay out the rating list, ideally till you find a tenant, but but certainly many, many months after after the completion of those works. And it's just worth mentioning when eventually they do get round to the valuation of his local authority, do bring a property into the rating list. If it is still vacant, you still have that statutory void period, three or six months that then applies before you start paying the full, full empty rates. Um, Similarly, should there be should there be an exemption applied to the property so you don't pay rates liability? So I mentioned listed buildings earlier, but what happens when you get a situation where you've got partially listed buildings? We've we've had some facade of buildings listed, but we managed to, to to demonstrate that actually it's so integral to the to the redevelopment opportunities within the site that actually the whole building should be exempt from from, from empty rates liability. And similarly, the, the kind of final point here is really around temporary occupation. You can reset that void period by reoccupying a property for six weeks. So you probably, yeah, lots of people have kind of come across. In fact, there's a whole kind of industry out there where you can pay companies in effect to come and occupy your property. The occupation, what what constitutes rate the leading case was 120,000 square foot warehouse, so a big warehouse where the ratepayer occupied, so put a few files in the building or a few boxes of files, I should say, and they occupied 0.2% of the floor space. And that was enough to be rateable occupation. So the courts have determined on this, look, you can, you can reoccupy your property in a minimal way, and then you're entitled to a new void period of, of, of three or six months. So you can do that yourselves, or you can, you get yeah, there's lots of companies that will come in and, 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 and offer rateable occupation in effect. Just worth mentioning at this point, they're looking at this and I'll, I'll come on to this as one of the kind of topical issues, but the six week occupation, they're kind of looking at that, that at the moment. And then finally, as a landlord, you should always look at whether or not the rateable value is putting off prospective tenants, even if you're not liable yourself. So the classic example of this is a listed building, has a rateable value, it's empty, you're not paying as a landlord, but actually the rateable value is putting off prospective tenants from, 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 uh, from in the space. So often, um, yeah, and as a landlord, you have a right of appeal on any property that 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 is under your portfolio, even if it's occupied, even if you're not the rate payer because the tenant is paying rates, you still have a right of appeal if you think the rateable value is is, is too high. So just to kind of close off from us, um, we just want to talk very briefly about the um, duties notified. Um, ben, do you want to just 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 quickly cover this off? Yeah. 
Yeah, so in terms of the GDC Notify, this is one of the changes we talked about the 2026 revaluation that's coming in in three years time. Um, so that's going to be based on levels of value in the 1st of April 2024. Um, included with that is going to be this annual return. So we're moving more towards uh, ratepayers having to submit an annual return whereby they're having to disclose any changes in tenure information, but also any changes to the building that are rateable. So, um, you know, Currently, there's no obligation on the ratepayer to disclose if, for example, they take a warehouse and they put a mezzanine floor in. It, at the moment, there's no obligation for the ratepayer to disclose that, take an extension to a building. Again, it's up to the valuation office and the local authority to track that through planning portals, through uh, random inspections, and, and they have a number of databases they can collect this information from. Um, it's now going to be on the tenants uh, to carry out this annual return and and also within that financial year if they make any changes between the 1st of april and the 31st of march they will also have to disclose those changes within 60 days and they'll have to notify the valuation office agency within 60 days and there are some quite tight penalties um, that will be based on a percentage of the rateable value that they fail to disclose so there is going to be a need for every rate power across the uk to to have advice on on this as there are thousands of properties across the UK currently where there is space that the valuation of this are, un, are unaware of they just don't have the resource to be able to get around and pick up on all the changes that are happening across the you know, 2.1 uh, million commercial properties across the UK so they are moving more towards this self-assessment um, and and more towards this annual return that will have to be carried out by every occupier so it's it's something that needs to be kept an eye on and it's something that needs uh, uh, advice from now because any change that you're making to the building today if not picked up on today or in the next year or two years it will be picked up on that annual return and how will that affect the rateable value and how can it be backdated um, and is there any accrual needed in terms of a charge are we better to you know, disclose now to the valuation office agency as opposed to wait until 2026 when we've got to disclose it anyway so it, it, a big change uh, and something that all ratepayers should be getting advice on ed you're going to talk about the avoidance yeah so um just 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 very quickly then to kind of close off on, on the i mentioned earlier temporary occupation the rules around that being six weeks the government has just closed the consultation period that ended at the end of September, 28th of September, and looking at, at, at changing the rules to make temporary occupation, you know, basically unworkable in, in, in ultimately. Um, and the, the ways they're looking at it is they're saying, well, look, actually, maybe we should make the occupation period for longer, so make it for six months. That's exactly what's happened in Scotland about seven, eight years ago. They've already tightened up on this. Similarly, in Wales, a couple of years ago, they've they've tightened up on, on temporary occupation. So they basically made it so it's kind of unworkable and you 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 have to be in occupation for six months in order to get to the relief. Um, they're also looking at whether or not they, they look at limiting the number of times um, empty, rate, re, empty rates relief can be claimed during a given period. And also whether or not I mentioned you know, that, that case law around occupying 0.2% of the floor space. And they're looking at whether or not actually the requirement is if you are in rateable occupation, you need to be occupying more than 50 percent of the floor space. So, so, so really sort of tight, tightening up on the rules around that. So we don't know the results of that consultation yet. We're waiting for that. But it could be that they tighten up on these rules as soon as the new financial year. So from from April next year, it will be it will be it will cause a lot of landlords a lot of issues because in some cases they this is the only way they can reduce their tax liability on on, on these on these properties so you know, landlords you know there's this kind of assumption that you know they, they you know landlords want empty buildings and yet they pay 100 percent tax liability on it um so so yeah it's we'll, we'll watch this space and we'll, we'll know more once that consultation um uh, results have, have, have been published so look just just final slides that kind of covers everything that we we offer in terms of our services and bits and pieces which covers all the various points that we've discussed um and i think I think that is it from from us. So I'm handing over to. Yeah. Thank you, guys. That's really very informative. There's quite a lot to take in there. Slides will be available and obviously the recording as well. So just. As the as, as the final excitement for the for the afternoon, Jessica and, and Priya. Hi, sorry, just give me one moment. 
Okay. Um, so me and my colleague Priya, we're going to be talking today about the Building Safety Act. Um, I am going to go through a sort of brief overview of the Act with everybody, um, but I do warn you, the Act is absolutely massive. It's 262 pages on its own, um, and I think there's 25 supporting regulations at the moment. Um, so I'm just going to try and cover all the key parts, and then Priya is just going to talk about some of the potential implications on the property industry. So taking a step back with all things building safety, it's important to remember that this act never uh, didn't emerge in isolation. So the starting point is the Grenfell Tower tragedy in which 72 people lost their lives. And just to put that into perspective, it's the greatest loss of human life in a residential fire since World War II. So we know that the cause of the fire that night was an electrical fault, but the spread of fire throughout the building was accelerated by combustible cladding together with an air gap in the external structure, which enabled the stack effect and allowed the fire to spread very quickly upwards. That night triggered a chain of events. The political reaction was fast. An independent report concerning building regulations and fire safety and, and how they contributed to um, the tragedy was almost immediately commissioned. And this was undertaken by Dame Judith Hackett. And the conclusions drawn by her report were absolutely scathing. It identified systematic and endemic failures across the property industry. The four main problems being ignorance of regulations, indifference to safety of residents, lack of clarity on responsibilities and inadequate regulatory oversight and enforcement tools. Investigations carried out in the aftermath of Grenfell quickly revealed that um, that particular building was no exception. In fact, large numbers of buildings were clad in dangerously combustible materials. And not only that, many buildings were found to be non-compliant with other fire safety measures. So they were suffering from issues such as missing cavity barriers and a lack of compartmentation. Leaseholders began to face huge service charge demands, as I'm sure everybody's seen, for remediation costs or just temporary measures to mitigate um, these issues, such as waking watch relief. Um, they then faced significant increases in insurance costs, and some buildings' insurance premiums were increasing by over a thousand percent. And to add insult to injury, flats with fire safety defects were valued at considerably less than their purchase price, and in some instances had no value at all. As a result, lenders concluded that they couldn't reliably lend money for the purchase of properties, and that led to a collapse in sales of flats. And it ultimately impacted the entire housing market because flats are quite often um, a person's first home. And all of these factors sort of combined created a social crisis. Um, the government committed to act, and we got our first legislative response in the form of the Fire Safety Act 2021. But shortly thereafter, the Building Safety Bill was introduced and it was designed to learn the lessons from Grenfell and to take forward the government's commitment to fundamental reform of the building safety system. So from the outset, the key objectives were identified as strengthening the regulatory system and ensuring greater accountability for fire and structural safety issues throughout the life cycle of buildings. Other clear themes emerged from the debate um, as the bill passed through Parliament with reiteration on the issue of being who would pay for remediation of historic defects and how to encourage confidence in lenders. The resulting act, as Jason said, is certainly groundbreaking. Um, it really is, for me, a once in a generation reform. It doesn't just reform the position as we understand it in relation to landlord and tenant and construction law, but it also impacts on safety and regulatory law. Its impacts far reaching and it will affect anybody involved in the design, construction, occupation of a building. And it also impacts on other sectors that are closely linked to the property industry. So looking at insurance companies, um, obviously lenders and things like that. So I don't have time to go through everything um, that the Act brought in today, but um, just keeping in mind those objectives, I'm just going to consider some of the more significant changes implemented by the Act. So, as part of strengthening the regulatory system, um, it establishes this new role under part two of the Act, um, which is the building safety regulator. Um, and this particular um, entity will sit within the health and safety executive, and they see their role as overseeing the safety and standard of all buildings, improving competence in the industry and implementing the new regime. Um, not only will they be doing all of this, they have been granted some very real enforcement powers by the Act in order to make sure um, that they can do their job. So I think prior to the introduction of the Act, sanctions for sort of breaching building regulations was limited to a fine of £5,000 for a defaulting company. Well, the Act 
um, introduces unlimited fines and personal criminal liability for officers of companies who commit offences under the Act. Um, and it's, it's the BSR that will really take these actions forward. The new regime, well, the framework for this is set out in part three of the Act. And a lot of this framework, people who are interested in this sector might have seen actually came into effect on the 1st of October with um, the introduction of three sets of regulations. So one of the big changes that we've got is the implementation of a new gateway regime. And this comprises a series of hard stops that a construction project will now need to pass through in order to proceed to construction, completion, and then occupation. And these are sort of designed to keep safety at the heart of the process. So you've got um, gateway one, which is your planning gateway. Um, and, and that needs to be approved before anything can begin. Um, you've then got gateway two, which is your pre-construction, which is where the building safety regulator will sign off any plans. And then we move to completion, which is previously um, you could sort of use various building inspectors to sign off on, on construction projects and to say that they've been built to standard. Moving forwards, this is a role that will be taken on by the building safety regulator. There will be a list of improved building inspectors who have to pass certain tests to show their competence. Um, and one of the big impacts of Gateway 3, and I know is a lot of concern in the construction industry at the moment, is the fact that what will now happen moving forwards is once you've built your building um, and you've got everything into place, you will apply to the building safety regulator for a completion certificate. Um, the building safety regulator will then have a statutory period of eight weeks to consider that application and approve it. Now, there will obviously be a delay there between um, completion and occupation as a result. Um, you cannot occupy a higher risk building without it being having a valid completion certificate um, and also being registered on the higher risk buildings register, which is um, something that will be done after completion, but will be a part of that Gateway 3 application. Um, if you occupy a building without that valid completion certificate or without it being registered, then the principal accountable person is committing an offence and is liable to a fine or imprisonment. Um, other parts of the new regime include the fact, as, as I've just mentioned, that the building safety regulator will now be the building control authority for higher risk buildings. Um, there's also the implementation of new statutory responsibilities on duty holders throughout um, the design um, and build of um, the, the actual building itself. So this attributes a whole bunch of responsibilities and legal obligations on people involved in construction. So, for example, your contractors, your designers and things like that. Um, there's now an obligation to maintain what is known as a golden thread of information throughout a building's life cycle. And this is all the information that will really tell us what the building is constructed of. And there's never been any obligation to have this information to hand before. The building safety regulator will now be able to demand it um, at any point. So there's a lot more record keeping. Um, there's also introducing a mandatory reporting of prescribed safety occurrences. So it's it's a little bit early to say what the effect of these changes will be. We'll start to see it in the next couple of years um, because at the moment we're in a sort of transitional period where it doesn't necessarily affect buildings being constructed right now unless they start um, unless they've started very recently. Um, but at a very basic level, it's really encouraging that culture change um, that they were intending to see by the Act, and it incentivizes sort of compliance with regulations in a way that it didn't before. I mean, we had a round table with developers last week and um, on, on this very issue, and they generally agreed that the changes would sort of change the way in which they approach construction projects, but it was more likely to just make the, the general costs more sort of front-loaded. So there's a lot to think about in terms of funding. Um, so although buildings obviously will hopefully be safer moving forwards, we've still got thousands of buildings. I think at last count it was 12,500 um, that are potentially affected by historic defects or fall within this sort of higher risk category, um, which if I've not said already, that's buildings over 18 metres or seven storeys. So part four of the act really changes the way in which we deal with the occupation of high risk buildings. 
Firstly, it introduces this new role of the accountable person. And an accountable person is an organization or individual that owns or has a legal obligation um, to repair any common parts of the building. And that may well be more than one for each building, in which case you have to identify a principal accountable person, which is the person who owns or has the legal obligation to repair the structure. Um, so the accountable person will be this designated person who's got a continuing duty to assess and manage the safety of a building in accordance with the Act. And they're also going to be responsible for implementing parts of the new regime insofar as it relates to occupation. So they'll assist the building safety regulator in their new role. So, for example, the new regulations impose sort of duties on um, the accountable person to prepare um, or at least apply for the building assessment certificate, which will um, involve sort of compiling safety case reports, which show how our buildings are made up and the structural stability and things like that. They'll have to prepare residents engagement strategies and really work with residents on sort of promoting safety in their buildings. And the idea of all of this is to keep residents at the very heart of what is going on. Um, another sort of um, probably one of the more publicised aims of the Act was to achieve this sort of polluter pays policy because a lot of leaseholders were facing these really significant service charge bills um, for repairing sort of affected buildings and traditionally or ordinarily the way in which these are dealt with is a leaseholder will pay a service charge for repairs to the structure which would include the cost of recladding and things like that. Um, but these costs were sort of in the millions and millions of pounds and it seemed very, very unfair that leaseholders who probably had the least part, well, actually had the least part to play, play in the crisis were the ones paying for it. So we were hoping to achieve a polluter pays policy um, and to achieve this, the Act introduces a series of protections for leaseholders and although I've mentioned that this Act really deals with higher risk buildings, those being over 18 metres, these protections apply to any building over 11 metres or five storeys. Um, so in some instances, um, leaseholders don't actually have to pay any costs associated with remedying relevant defects at all, and they're shielded from other ancillary costs, so legal costs and other professional costs, for example, the costs of obtaining reports in order to de determine whether there even are relevant defects. Um, the idea was if leaseholders weren't paying, then everybody would look elsewhere um, for somebody else to pay. And in the in first instance, developers, as you might have seen, were invited to do the right thing with threats that they'd be blocked from the market if they failed to do so. And many big developers did publicly pledge to sign the developer remediation contract. Um, but my understanding is that those threats made by Gove in terms of blocking them from the market actually only applies to developers whose operating profits are over £10 million annually. Um, so the voluntary programme only really has a limited effect. And given that the potential costs of these remediation programmes are millions of pounds, smaller developers are less proactive, which sort of brings me on to part five. Um, so for those developers, the Act introduces new redress measures. So, for example, new causes of action in the form of a remediation order or remediation contribution order. And these are applications that are made in the tribunal. And you can get an order um, requiring that works must be done or that somebody must pay the cost of those works. The Act also considerably extends the ability to bring claims under the Defective Premises Act and extends limitation from six years to 30 years. And it allows us to pursue claims that were previously time barred and it extends liability to connected companies recognizing the issues with developers setting up SPVs and ongoing claims can be amended to retrospectively take advantage of the provisions. There is also a statutory obligation on the accountable personal building owners to pursue this litigation where appropriate which is great news for us. Um, other things that part five do, does is introduce a new home ombudsman scheme, which is aimed at providing a forum for owners of newly built homes to seek redress against developers and builders. And it also requires buildings to have a 15 year new build warranty in place, um, which I suspect is going to have quite an impact on the insurance market. Um, and it also introduces a new cause of action in relation to the production of construction projects. So the Act provides that all construction projects, market, um, construction products marketed in the UK moving forwards will fall under a regulatory regime, allowing them to be withdrawn from the market if they present a risk. 
Finally, we've got part six, which is really just um, sort of miscellaneous provisions to tidy up um, the act and, and the way in which we do things. But I do highlight that this is the part of the act that brings in what I mentioned earlier, that it's now potentially possible in a lot of circumstances where if an offence is committed under the act, although that offence would have been committed by the company, if we can show that one of the officers of that company um, was sort of responsible in any way for that offence having been committed, you can pursue those people um, directly um, and there are potential criminal sanctions as a result. Um, so I think that is as quickly as I can get through the Act and I'll hand over to Priya. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jess, and uh, credit to yourself because the um, defect, the whole Act in, in itself is completely mammoth, so well done for getting through it. Um, Tailing off on what Jess was saying about insure, uh, limitation periods, I just want to talk to the audience a little bit about uh, the insurance implications of the Act. The extension of limitation periods of the Defective Premises Act 1972 from six years to 30 years retrospectively and 15 years prospectively seems to have been imposed by the government without consideration as to whether insurance insurers will absorb this much increased period of potential liability. I think it's a fair question to ask how this will impact professional indemnity insurance, how will the insurance industry will respond. Um, from our observation so far, we've seen that several insurers have responded by adding new exclusions in policy wordings from renewal. Many policies are already providing exclusion clauses for these circumstances. The extension of limitation periods may also require amendments to be made to standard form building contracts as well. So that's just something that us as lawyers and conveyances will need to be mindful of as well. And I think as a general point, I think we are likely to see insurance premiums increase along the supply chain. The length of the limitation period creates the potential for challenge under the Human Rights Act 1998. So we can't forget about that either. This is because the lapse of time means it may not be possible to have a fair trial, which is Article 6, but it will have a major implication for stakeholders. The Act also introduces a new head of damages, which is economic loss due to a dwelling becoming unfit for habitation. Previously, economic loss would only have been covered when it was linked to claims where damage or injury has occurred. But this now creates a potential gap in cover as well. Um, keeping within our time frame, I'm very mindful that it's one o'clock. Um, it's important that we also little bit, talk a little bit about risk mitigation as well. Given the changes and insurance implications of this new legislation, public sector organisations should review their risk mitigation strategies to ensure they are appropriate. Liabilities, but also an organisation's uh, recourse to compensation have shifted in some areas and new measures may be required. The practical advice that we're giving to a lot of our clients is more record keeping will be essential. Under the Building Safety Act 2022, it is possible to pursue the manufacturer and or supplier of any defective material, even if there is no contract between the organisation and that party. This means that rather than just holding details of the main contractors, it will be important to hold details on all parties to the work. Um, there's a hell of a lot more to be said about the insurance implications, but I think what I've highlighted today are just the sort of key points. And um, that will be that will be all for today, I think, in, ter in terms of just keeping to our timing as well. So I'll pass over to Jason. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, apologies for the, for the rush at the end. I'm sure we can um, get on another webinar and we can uh, get filled in a little bit more about uh, the implications there, because I think it's really useful. And because of all the uncertainty surrounding it, I think there's lots and lots of questions that people will have um, regarding it as well. So um, I think that was a hugely informative session. Thank you to the speakers, Marion, Ben, Ed, Jessica and Priya. If you have any questions, please go directly or you can let us know and we'll pass on um, pass on that and put you in touch. Also send around the slides and the recording if you'd like to go back through it. Um, we'll be hosting more webinars in the new year, so keep a lookout. Um, and I think finally have a great festive period and a happy new year. And what we will try and do as well to the participants, is there is a Looking forward to the potential change of administration um, webinar, which is happening um, this lunchtime. Um, if anyone would like to attend that, we'll put that link up in the chat as well. Thank you, everybody. Um, looking forward to your questions and we'll see you again in the new year.